The point of that is wisdom makes a big difference in life. So uh, I almost fell off a ladder uh, Friday, but I'm going to tell you why. Um, Because part of our job as parents is helping our kids, hopefully, to be wise, right? That's part of the thing. You want to help them to be wise. So I'm on the top of a ladder, hanging lights, quietly, by myself. I'm on the tippy top of the ladder. Not the, not the OSHA's you're in trouble part, but right below that. The, this is the highest, don't go above this thing. I'm smart enough to know that because George doesn't want to have to give me CPR. So I'm at the top of the ladder, arms above my head. My daughter pops her head out the door and goes, Wow! And I go, and she goes, what? I go, okay, let me just teach you, just teaching moment. Never, when someone is on the top of a ladder, number one, number two, dealing with electricity, three, with their arms in the air, come up behind them and go, hey! So instead of saying, you know, Dad, you're so smart, which is what I want my children to do, Just look at me and say, yes, Father, your wisdom goes beyond my... Father, you're so... Don't your kids do that, right? Only if they want to go somewhere or they need money. Then suddenly it's, Father, may we get the Panera for lunch? Father. But instead, she says, I didn't talk that loud. So after I knocked her down, no, I didn't. I said, yes, you did. I said, it echoed off the porch back to you. I said, regardless of all of that, I was alone in the quiet with my arms above my head on a ladder, which I don't like, with electricity. So even, by the way, by the way, the only thing worse than yelling at somebody when they're alone and in the quiet, is doing what my other son does, and he did it. I'll never forget, I almost threw a peanut butter uh, uh, jelly knife at him because in the middle of the night, he came around the corner in the kitchen and said, hey. (laughs) Ah! (laughs) That's the only thing worse. So we try to teach our kids wisdom, how to be wise. By the way, did any of you know you shouldn't yell at the pastor when he's on the top of a ladder? Anybody here? Okay, thank you. If you don't know that yet, now you do. You have wisdom. You've been given the wisdom of Solomon today. So here's the thing. Wisdom is very different, and it's different for different people, and it's different in different situations. We're going to look at Esther chapter 2 today, and here's the deal. You're going to find out. So so let me go back and give you a little last weekend, what we talked about in chapter 1, a little recap. And today we're going to talk about what kind of people does God bless? And we're going to talk a lot about this idea of wisdom, and we're going to really look at three things that are, that are wise decisions, and they, they make a difference of what you do when, you ready? When you're uncertain, when you're dealing with uncertainty. And so if the doctor says to you, uh, we're going to do some tests, that's called uncertainty. When the boss says, we're going to have to evaluate you, That's called uncertainty. When your spouse says, I'm not so sure this is going to work out, that's uncertainty, right? When you have children, in general, that's uncertainty. When they turn into teenagers, that's massive uncertainty. Like, which child are you getting when they come home, right? You don't know. You're like, the nice kid left and the mean one came home. What happened? Right? Right? Been there? All right, so uncertainty, and how do we deal with uncertainty? And in the story of Esther, she makes very different choices than Daniel. Even though, under Medes and Persians, she is in a little different place, dealing with different situations, and so is her cousin. And so, we're going to look at this today. Now, remember that this is about 486 B.C., so it's after the book of Ezra, And it's before the book of Nehemiah when when they're returning to Israel. So some of the people are already returning. It's after, remember Daniel, Rakshak, and Benny 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, uh, those stories were before. That's when they were dragged out. Um, they came into town, into Babylon. Xerxes, the dude who's in charge now, is mad at Babylon. And actually, he doesn't even call himself. The other kings called themselves king of Babylon. He didn't even do that. He said, I'm the king of the Medes Persians. And he actually punished Babylon, took their statues, melted a gold statue down for his own coffers. I mean, all kind of stuff. They were ticked off. So very different time they're living in. And so Esther now had to do things differently than Daniel did. And so we're going to look at this today and this wisdom, this time had passed. Now, in chapter 1, you remember the king Xerxes had a party. And we talked about this last week. He had a party. And why did he have a party? Well, he invited all the politicians, got them drunk, and then said, by the way, I need you to send me all your armies and, and navies to go with me into battle. And, so, and then he gave them all of this nice gold cup, which nowadays we call a bribe or we just call it Congress. And... Um, Did you know you can follow congressmen's stock trades? Just, okay. Anyway, so um, that's just a coincidence that they do really well. <laughs> anyway, they give him a gold cup. We may even have one of these gold cups in the Met up in New York City. We have a cup from that time. We think maybe that cup. And uh, so, so what happens? So four years passes between chapter one and chapter two. In that time, Xerxes goes to war. He listens to really dumb advice, which seems to be a habit for Xerxes. And he's impulsive. Listening to bad advice and being impulsive, that's real. You all, we all have that friend, don't we? Don't we all have that friend who does those things? So that's Xerxes. So he takes his navy to take on the Greek army, and he says, we're going to take our navy, and this guy basically talks him into taking his navy and putting them in a marina, even though they weren't made for marina fighting. And so then the Greeks just come, and they get wiped out. And so Xerxes now heads back home. He gets home, and he's lonely because he misses his wife, who he put in exile because she wouldn't come to the party and show off her bod for all her, his friends. And so... Now he's lonely and trying to figure out what to do next. So in chapter 2, same advisors trying to help. He needs some new advisors. Trying to help the king. And that's what we're going to pick up today. And so we're going to talk today about how uh, did Esther, how did her family deal with uncertainty? How did she do what was right during this time? Because here's the deal. Everyone wants to be blessed. Nobody says to me, if I say, do you want to be blessed? Nobody says, nope. Everybody does. But in order to be blessed, what do you have to do? You have to be obedient to God. You can't just do what feels right to you. You can't just do what society tells you is right. You have to do what God shows you from his word is right. And so we're going to talk about those three things today. And here we go. Number one, be compassionate and serve others in difficult times. Let me read the passage and then we're going to talk about this. Uh, uh, chapter four, here's, here's King Xerxes getting some advice. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair. I could not say that name right, but that's as close as you're getting. The son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by you remember this story, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Remember we talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, all those guys brought. So he was brought, their grandparents were brought out. Okay. Among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah, Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up, and you'll never hear that name again because they changed her name. They were like, that's not a great name. So they kept going, all right? This young woman who was also known as... Esther, that one you know, had a lovely figure. By the way, never tell a woman that. Had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. Time out. So, if you read this passage, the author here is purposefully letting you know that Mordecai's life is not great. Mordecai, his family, lost everything everything. They lost their homeland. They lost their culture. They lost their homes. They lost their livestock. They lost any riches they had, all of it, all gone. He's taken into captivity. That's not in this passage by accident. 
That's in here to show you that Mordecai was dealing with uncertainty, even tragedy. And yet, in the middle of all that, he looks at one of his cousins whose parents died. From what? No idea. But that's not the important part of the story. The fact is that Mordecai had tons of excuses to say, I don't have time for this. I'm dealing with my own struggles. I'm dealing with my own difficulty. My life is hard right now. I can't deal with one more problem. Why do I need to do it? None of that. You know what he does? He takes her as his own. Why? Because he sees a need even in the middle of a horrible situation. And he knows that God has called him to meet that need. As an older cousin, he was called to do that. Now, not only was that a family requirement in that society, he didn't have to. He could have said no. And one of the things I will tell you is this. I am the master of excuses. I am amazing. I can pull into a McDonald's and immediately discover that there's a sale on the most fattening thing on the menu and justify choosing that. We have a propensity at justifying our behavior, especially when we don't feel like doing something. Listen to this. This is, this is 25 years of ministry talking here, maybe 30. Uh, uh, when people have kids and they've got little toddlers running around, they'll, they'll come to church and say, I can't serve because um, I've had the kids all week and they're not sleeping enough and I, I'm just tired. I can't serve anymore. I ju I'm just not able to. And then their kids get an elementary and then they say, oh, well, the kids are tired this weekend. They've had so many activities. We just can't come. And then they hit junior high and they say, well, we would be coming and helping except our kids are involved in this activity and this sport and this drama club and this band and this blah, 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 and this traveling team and this, that. And so then they can't when they're in junior high or high school. And then uh, uh, when they're in college, they say, well, we don't want to be tied down. Our kid might come into town or we need to go see them so we can't serve at church. We can't serve people in our community because we've got to go places so we can't commit to anything, and then they get to be seniors at church, and they say, oh, I've already done my time, I'm too old to serve. I have seen, because I've been in ministry long enough, I've seen people go from preschoolers to old people and make all those excuses, and what's funny is, as the pastor, when they do the old person excuse, I look at them and say, served your time? When? You ever heard, you want something done, ask a... Busy person. Why? Because life is about inertia. And when we get used to not doing things, you know what we start doing? Not doing things. This was a guy who sat at the gate. You know what that meant? That meant most likely he was a wise person. He may have been a, a market trader. He had something to do with the gates opening and closing. We don't exactly know. But we know that wise men sat at the gates and people would ask them advice. We assume that's what happened here. And yet he had a thousand excuses not to adopt Esther as his own. But you know what he did? He did what God called him to do. So the question for us today is, are we doing what God's called us to do? Can I tell you a secret about walking on water? You know, Peter walks on water in the Bible. Did you know that after that, Jesus stilled the water? Not before. I don't know about you, but I prefer to walk on still water. I prefer to go through life when it's easy. I prefer to go through life when there's no trials, no struggles, no difficulty, no doctor appointment, no, right, fill in the blank. And yet, God does miracles when life is the hardest. So don't use your life being difficult as an excuse for not looking how to bless and encourage, be a neighbor, be a parent, be a school mom, be a school dad, be a person who looks for opportunities to say, how can I bless others? Listen to what it says in the book of Ephesians. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Why? 
because nobody wants to be around you when you're like that. Do, do you want to be around an angry person? When it says bitter, by the way, it means poison. Have you ever been around somebody who tells you the same story year after year about why they're mad? And you want to say to them, get over it? You're like, I know that matters, and I know that's important, and I know that matters to you, and I'm sorry that that happened, but you're no longer living when you allow bitterness from the past to infiltrate your life, you know what you're doing? You're putting an anchor on your life that's keeping you from enjoying today what God wants to do today. Hey, in this life, can I tell you something? Life is unfair. If you allow the unfairness of yesterday, the hurts of yesterday, that person who hurt you, and listen, please, please name it. It's okay. You don't have to deny that what they did was bad or horrible. But quit living there. Say, God, I choose to forgive. What does that mean? You're just letting that go. It doesn't mean that you're saying what they did was okay. It doesn't mean that you're saying they're a good person. It doesn't mean that you're allowing that person or thing back in your life. But you are moving ahead. Why? Because you don't need an anchor. Why? Because if you're going to be able to do what's next, let go of brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. And then it says this. So now you can switch to the other side. Be kind. Don't chew like a cow. Right? Being kind is being thoughtful for other people. Are you kind? By the way, it's where we get the word grace from, this word kind. It's where we get the word grace from. Give others grace. Be gracious to other people. So be kind and compassionate to one another. And then it says this, forgiving one another. Why? Just as Christ, in Christ, God forgave you. I was listening to a podcast this week, and just out of nowhere, I knew this sermon, I was working on this sermon, and it was a long podcast. So if you're ADD like me, and you're listening to a long podcast, that means you're listening to one twelfth of a podcast, because you're just driving, and the podcast's going, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the guy said, keep compassionate people close. Now, this guy wasn't a Christian. This guy's a pagan, but you know what he realizes? That you want some compassionate people in... you. You need some compassionate people in your life. Esther needed her cousin. She needed her cousin in her life. Why? Because she needed that influence. Do you have someone in your life who is compassionate? And, and are you that person for someone else? Be kind and serve. Be compassionate and serve others, even in difficult. I know you're going through a hard time. Figure out some way to serve. Regardless of what's going on, how can you serve? How can you bless What's some kindness you can do? But Eric, you don't understand. I've got this and this and this and this and this. Okay, okay, okay. So what can you do? I, I don't care if it has anything to do with church. I want you to be obedient to God. You know why Jesus washed the disciples' feet? This is really deep theology. Because they were dirty. There you go. So, so where should you help? Where there's a need. So look and say, where is there a need? What is there? So where can I be kind and compassionate to somebody around me? Number two. Listen to wisdom in uncertainty. I have had some amazing counselors in my life. Dave Daniel was one of my counselors. His wife actually has come to church the last couple of weeks on Saturday night. And I didn't brag on him last night, but so many times I would go to the house and just sit with him. He started struggling with something very similar to Parkinson's where he was losing his mobility and then eventually he lost his voice. But even when he was immobile and couldn't go anywhere, I would go to his house and sit with him and we would just talk about church and his years of experience and I would ask him questions and write down. And if you go to my office, there's a notebook that says Dave Daniel on it, which is just advice and encouragement that he gave me, different things that he gave me, books he asked me to read, things he told me to do. And I looked looked for that opportunity. I got to be a part of Rudy Moberg's funeral just last weekend, and one of the things I noticed when different people talked is a lot of them, Rudy just, when they were going through a hard time, he just took them for a drive. Well, I remember in my life during a really hard time that Rudy took me for a drive, and during that drive, Rudy would just talk, and we'd pray together, and we'd talk, and I can still, to this day, you got to realize, I can't remember what I did or ate yesterday was a salad. But, but I can't remember that, but I can remember what Rudy told me on that drive 15 years ago. And so you need somebody to speak in your life, especially when you're going through difficulty. 
We tend to make really bad decisions when we're angry, when we're hungry, when we're lonely, when we're tired. By the way, they teach that in AA. Did you know that? It's called HALT. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And so during those times, what do we need? We need wisdom from other people. So listen to what happens next. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Now, here's the deal. This, we just read that like it's no big deal. Imagine if somebody just came and said, we're just rounding up all your daughters. What? I mean, we read that like we, we just read it. That was unsettling. But listen to what happens next. Esther, who was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge, had charge of the harem... Okay, then we keep going, sorry. She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately, he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants to the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background. Why? Because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day, I love this, Mordecai walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was doing and what was happening to her. What, what happened? She would seek him out and ask him advice. Now, remember Daniel, when he was taken captive, they said, he went to the guard and said, we're Jewish, we will not eat that food. Do you remember that? We all make a big deal about that story. I think there's a Daniel diet plan. You know, they make everything into a diet plan so the authors can make money. Did I say that out loud? Sorry. Right? Everything becomes a diet plan because we all want to be on a diet. Oh, the Daniel plan. Oh, I got to do that one. Right? Well, I like the Esther plan better. Because you know what he said? Don't tell anybody. You know what that meant? That meant she had to eat what everybody else ate. Because you would know very quickly if somebody was Jewish at that time by what they ate because they had a very different diet. And he said to her, don't do that. And so you might be saying, well, how do I know whether I should do what Daniel did or whether I should do what Esther did when I'm dealing with difficulty? Listen to wisdom. Do what God called you to do. What God calls you to do in a certain situation may be very different from what God calls someone else to do in the very same situation. Just be obedient to his word and be obedient to him and he will give you wisdom. Let's see what it says in Ephesians 1. I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. So Paul's praying for the early, early church. And what does he pray? He prays that they'll know the Father. He prays that they'll know God's love. Why? Because no matter what's happening in your life, when your number one goal is to say, God, I want to know you, I want to walk with you, then whatever happens next, you're ready for. Whatever happens next, you say, God, would you give me wisdom as I walk through this? Lord, would you give me courage to stand up against what I need to stand up again, but, all, against, but also to do what you've called me to do? Number three, are you humble and thoughtful when promoted? So see, you already have Esther, and she's been given facial treatments and seven servants. Most of us would just like one, right? Seven people to look after her, to follow her around. By the way, there was a boxer who had a guy he paid to follow him around. I think it was Mike Tyson had a guy follow him around just to tell him how great he was. Did you know that? He paid a guy to just follow him around and say, dude, you are awesome. You are the best. You are, I want that. Can I pay one of you? Yeah. Right? So, right? Pay no do. So you can imagine what this was like. They knew. And so he said, seven of you follow her around. Take care of every need. That might make some of us a little arrogant. Especially when the king starts to favor us. Listen to what happens next. When the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted to the daughter of Abigail, to go to the king, she asked, listen, for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the harem, suggested. 
So even though she kept getting promoted, she still listened to this guy who was basically a servant. A lot of times when we start to get promoted or we've been at a job a long time or we've done something a long time, what happens? We can become more difficult, harder to be around. Some of us are like, yes, when we've been married a long time, right? All those things, right? What happened with her? She still listened. She still humbled herself. Listen. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head, made her queen instead of Vashti, and the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. What happened? She kept getting promoted. She kept becoming uh, uh, more and more and more important. Now she's queen. And what happens this whole time? She still listens to the people around her. She's still humble. She still cares. I saw an interview yesterday with Caitlin Clark, and I don't know if you've watched her at all play, but it's like watching Pistol Pete Maravich from the 70s play. I mean, yesterday, or a couple of days ago when she was playing, she's running full speed down the court. One of her teammates is running next to her, and I know you may not know anything about basketball, but what I'm about to tell you is crazy. She's running full speed, dribbling, and she passes behind her back to the person over here who then makes the shot. I was like, what just happened? And so this week, she was recognized as the female, uh, uh, she won an won a, uh, 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 Athlete of the Year or something for the ESPYs Award. And they were interviewing her, and they said, how does it feel to be the first woman to, to get this award? And she said, what? How am I the first one? You realize that so-and-so is better than me, right? And she named other people who had gone before her who should have won the award first. That's humility. Most of us, when we start to get promoted and start to get together, what do we start to do? We look at other people and go, well, you should get your act together. What happened? Even as she was promoted, she became more humble. Are we still humble? Do you realize in America how much we've been given? How blessed we are? Listen, we were this far, this far from being a different nation today. Regardless of what you think about candidates or this, that, and the other, imagine if it was your candidate what you would think. If you don't like this candidate, guess what? We're still this far from a totally different day to day. And you better thank God that that, that was escaped last night. Because no matter what you think, God, we need you is what you should be praying today. And as we go through this life and life gets difficult and gets uncertain, we can become arrogant and say, well, they deserved whatever and I've heard all this junk. And I'm like, are you crazy? Would you want that to happen to your children? Yourself? Don't wish it on anyone else. Listen to what it says. James 1, 9 and 10. Believers in humble circumstances should take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride, listen to this, in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. What's James saying? No matter whether you don't have your act together, then you should say, God, thank you for what I do have. And if you've got everything, you should say, thank you, God, that none of this matters. It's like going to pass away anyway. In the middle of all that, here's the question for you and for me. What's God calling you to do? What's difficult right now? Are you dealing with uncertainty? We all deal with uncertainty. Be obedient to God. Look for ways to serve and give compassion to other people. Even in the middle of your struggle, look for opportunities to do what God's called you to do. Be faithful and humble in it and say, God, I want to follow you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you after church about what it means, after the service, about what it means to be a Christian. And maybe today would be the day you say, God, I want to surrender. Eric, I want to surrender my life to Christ. And I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be saved. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, you're struggling with uncertainty. And maybe God's calling you to serve in an area, whether it's at our church or at home or in your community. Listen, be obedient to him and he'll help you to walk on water even in the storm. Let's close in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for your word. 
Lord, I thank you we can look back thousands of years to things that were going on, things that our society is so very different, they're hard to understand, and yet human nature is still the same. Father, I pray that we would recognize, as Esther did, that your hand is behind the course of our life. So, Lord, help us to listen to you. Help us to be obedient when it's hard. Lord, bless each one. I pray for that one that's struggling this morning. Maybe they're struggling with fear or loneliness. Lord, would you give them your strength? Would you speak to their hearts? In Jesus' name, amen.